I think we have almost everyone. There's no one else left in the waiting room. Should we go ahead and get started? Okay, so welcome everyone to our first official webinar with Brian Rosenblum. Thank you for being here, Brian. Um, I thought we could do a quick reintroduction for people who weren't here the first time. I'll go first so that I can um, go on mute so that my dog can get her squirrel back. Um, <laughs> I, I think let's try to keep it really short, maybe 30 seconds for the introductions just for the sake of time. So I'm Malia Perez. I'm the Scholars Program Coordinator. So I'm the person that you talk to if you have questions. Um, and I'm the one who typically bugs you in your email the most. So that's me. So we're going across the screen here. Mary Emma, hi everybody. Uh, outgoing director of the uh, Project of Black Writing, founding director, and I am delighted to welcome you as our new cohort. And I'll be talking a little bit shorter, a little bit later. I'll go. I'm also at KU. I'm Sarah Arbuthnot Lentz. I'm uh, the History of Black Writing, HBW. Um, I'm the Research Project Manager. And I'm really excited to work with all of you. I've been in Malia's position in the past, working with previous cohorts. Um, so I'm excited to see what all you work on this year. Nikki, you want to go next? Sure. Hi, I'm Nikki. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor at Howard University. This is actually my first year on the tenure track, finishing up in spring. So. I made it um, almost a few days left in the semester, but it's so nice to see you all. I actually watched uh, the webinar that I missed, unfortunately, but I uh, recognize a lot of you and um, I'm glad to be here. Seth, I'm just looking across the screen here. <laughs> Sure, I think my screen looks a little bit different, but uh, yeah, hi everybody, I nice know. to see, nice to see everyone. And Sarah, I recognize you from uh, previous videos, uh, so uh, hello again. <laughs> uh, so um, my name is Seth Wharton. I'm a, a creative writer and a critic, and uh, I teach in the uh, uh, Bachelor of Interdisciplinary Studies program at the University of Virginia. And uh, most of my research is focused on the American Southwest and U.S.-Mexico borderlands. So I'm looking to do something with the uh, African American literature in the Southwest. Uh, uh, here in this project. So, thanks. Yeah. And Caitlin, you look, you're next on our screen. Okay, here I go. Um, I'm Caitlin Shirley. I'm also at KU. I just submitted my thesis on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it's good to go. It was about, I took a couple of African American memoirs and applied a museum studies concept to them to show a new way of possibly interpreting memoir. Um, that perhaps allows it to be a better educational tool. But that's a project that I would like to incorporate DEH into somehow at some point. So that's kind of why I'm here. So that's all, that's me. Yeah. Uh, Kevin is next. Hi, I'm Kevin Hales and I teach in communication at Mighty Mizzou, the University of Missouri in Columbia. And I forget we've got two Kevins. <laughs> Oh, so, sorry about that, Kev. So, Kev, you go next. Kevin Lucas, you go next. <laughs> no worries. Uh, my name is Kevin Lucas. I teach in the Department of English and World Languages at Augusta University. Uh, looking forward to the rest of the project. Yeah. And Cedra, you're next on the screen. Hi, I'm Cedra Smith. I am um, what uh, we like to call an independent scholar. Um, I'm working for money. Um, at a uh, at a secondary school, and um, we'll be teaching um, uh, an online literature class uh, for advanced students um, next year. But um, my my uh, int uh, int scholarly interests are related to um, African American literature and culture, of course, um, particularly uh, intersections between um, literary. Vit literary, I made up a new word, literary <laughs> and visual literary. Uh, representation, right? So um, nice to see all of you. And Gina, you're next on this screen I'm looking at. 
Hi, um, it's good to be here. I, I was not able to make the first meeting, but I did watch the um, recording, so I got to learn about you all. But um, yes, I am a librarian and an archivist, but currently my full-time job is as a new, brand new uh, PhD student at Clark Atlanta University. So um, yeah, that's what I do for money. I'm a grown woman with a graduate assistantship. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Lavanda. Good afternoon. As you heard, my name is Lavanda Broadnax. I am very recently retired from the Library of Congress. But before I retired, I had this project where I identified African American women authors who lived during the Civil War. And I would like to use those women for my project. I like to continue my work and use them. Yeah. Robin. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to see you all again. I am Robin Brooks. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Africana Studies at the University of Pittsburgh, where I teach literature courses. I am currently waiting for my provost to send me my congratulations. You are now an associate professor with tenure. So that will be coming any day now. Um, and I am, I have been flirting with digital humanities for a few years now, but I've never really got my hands really deep into it. So um, I am, what is drawing my interest is, well, one is, is continuing to, it's not going away, right? We're seeing it more and more. But also here at Pitt, we have the, um, the papers of August Wilson. And you know, people make a big deal out of that, but we are also getting the papers for some other lesser known playwrights too. And so I'm just, you know, thinking in my head, you know, what are some things that I'll be able to do around those types of projects? Great, great, thank you. Ayana. Hello, I am Ayana Weekly. I'm an associate professor in women, gender and sexuality studies at Grand Valley State University, um, which is, on the west side of the state of Michigan, um, a little bit outside of Grand Rapids. Um, yes, similarly kind of um, flirting with different DH things over time. And um, the, especially in the last two years in the pandemic using more um, kind of social reading practices and social annotation with students that to order to make work, had me like building my own websites and other things, or at least trying to manage them. So I started doing more of those things online. And then um, I do research on uh, periodicals, uh, women's periodicals. And so um, thinking about DH possibilities that would be useful for making that kind of work more visible and available to um, people because there's so much visual aspect to magazines that kind of the usual ways of dissemination or writing about them don't work as well. So um, that's why I'm here. But also I was a fellow in the um, Zora Neale Hurston Summer Institute. So I could not uh, kind of resist kind of having another opportunity to work with um, Mary Emma and the team at KU. So I'm really excited to be included in the, this cohort this year. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Kevin, you've already gone. Maggie. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I am not. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Maggie. I am currently a graduate student at KU in museum studies. Um, so I'm in my first year, second semester, and <laughs> this week has been very, very hard for me, but I'm excited to be here. Um, my interest really does entail with um, Black history, Black culture, and Black life. I saw this as an opportunity to kind of narrow down, not narrow down, but hone in on my interest in incorporating digital humanities as I'm also in a introductory course, well, seminar into digital humanities as well, that basically would combine my two interests at the moment. Um, that could be the start of thinking about my thesis work, about what I would like to submit um, and defend. So excited to be here and see what's in store. 
And Michelle, last but not least. A mute. Oh, okay, I'm on mute, my bad. Uh, hello all, blessings to you. It is so good to see you again. Um, I am Michelle Gibbs. I'm assistant professor of theater arts at Illinois Wesleyan University. Um, I am very interested in the theatrical works of Zora Neale Hurston and my project is to build a website that's devoted to her theatrical work and making connections between that and perceptions of black women in the early 20th century. Welcome, everybody. Yes, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary Emma to introduce Mr. Rosenblum. OK, this is, this is great fun for me, because I get to introduce Brian Rosenblum, who has been working with us since the very beginning of the Black Book Interactive Project. We have been partners on every grant. We have, even before then, Brian and I went to Haiti together and did work in that right after the, 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 the earthquake. So it was just a wonderful experience. But Brian is in the library, KU libraries. Um, he is also the co-director of the, and the founding co-director, I guess, of the Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities, IDRH, and has brought to KU um, for, you had a you had 10th year anniversary, I guess, your 10th year anniversary. Was it 10 years? Yes. I think, I think 11 now. With 11 uh, now, I'm right. Track of time, but, That's yeah. right. Where every year we would have this wonderful symposium. And this is what all of us learned from. And it gave us the kind of fuel to continue this work through BPIP. So Brian today is going to kind of bring all the pieces that that um, that we you've been looking at on those various videos together. Uh, I will mention that that Brian himself has done some amazing work. Just recently come came back from Ghana, uh, and on a Fulbright related kind of is that what it was uh, related? Yeah, Fulbright related yeah. project, and it was very exciting. Um, and he may even incorporate some of that in his discussion. But uh, as I said, he has been a partner along the way, so uh, he knows pretty much every step. Uh, that we've taken. He's helped to guide us. He's pointed us in the right direction. So naturally, we went to him to think about uh, being sort of the glue uh, as you step into this, 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 this new cohort. So Brian, I thank you again for doing this. I know you've all, we're overworking you. And uh, if you need a, bre a breathing break, uh, we will uh, certainly encourage you to do that. If you've already been going at this for a couple of days, Thank you again, and I'll turn it over to you, Brian Rosen oh. Rosenblum, KU Libraries. Uh, thanks so much, Mary Emma and uh, Malia and Sarah for, for organizing this. Um, and yeah, it's really great to meet everyone here and to hear everything you're doing. So um, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to this. Uh, I'll just say a bit about me, I guess, and then, um, and then, a little bit about what I uh, will do during the session. Um, so as Mary Emma noted, I'm a, a librarian here at, at KU uh, and um, I work in the area of uh, digital humanities and open access publishing, uh, institutional repositories, electronic journals. Um, and since 2010, uh, yeah, we've been running the IDRH, Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities. Uh, which is kind of providing, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. Um, but that's uh, the unit on campus that kind of supports uh, faculty and students in their digital projects. Uh, so a lot of what I'm gonna, you know, the kind of perspective I'll bring to DH is the the library, uh, the perspective of a librarian. And I, I know we know, noted we have a couple librarians here on the call, uh, which is great. Um, and so it's more, uh, so a lot of those, those tend to be uh, issues around mm, metadata, sustainability, preservation of digital projects, uh, collaboration and project management and things like that. So I'll talk a little bit about those. Um, let me see what else I have on my uh, slides here. Well, you know, so I'm also uh, just, um, I had a, a, a kind of set of standard kind of intro to DH that I had presented for a long time, uh, but I'm trying to change that a bit because you know DH itself has changed a lot over the last ten years. Um, so 
I don't have a standard kind of intro at the moment. I've been playing around with some some slides and ideas, uh, and I'll so I'll talk a little bit about just some general concepts and different ways to think about DH. Uh, I want to share uh, a number of um, the kind of programs we're doing here at IDRH, not, not both as a pitch for IDRH, but also as a um, it, uh, the uh, kind of tra trajectory of IDRH sort of mirrors the, where DH has, has evolved in the last few years. Um, then I um, have a ton of uh, just pro examples of projects, different types of projects, genres, uh, and we can go through those um, as, you know, as you feel the interest or, or desire to do that. Talk a little bit about a couple other issues in DH and then also, um, wow, this is a lot. Well then, uh, I, then I wanna do sp spend some time on sustainability of digital humanities projects because that's a great thing to, st to really start thinking about at the very beginning of your project, even, even before you even have a project uh, sometimes. And then just point you to some, some resources. Uh, so that's kind of what I've got planned, but I also uh, just want it to be informal and more of a discussion. So feel free to ask questions anytime and uh, jump in or ask me to repeat things, or we can take it wherever wherever people want to go. Uh, I notice, I mean, there's a lot of, there's people at different stages of their careers and do, working on different types of projects. Um, so there's a lot to we, we could cover and hopefully there'll be stuff for for everybody um does all that sound good okay <laughs> so let's see um and then i would like to hear maybe after the slides a little bit uh, a little bit about more about kind of the projects you have in mind some of you some of you mentioned a little bit um so uh, <clears throat> you know, these, these presentations used to always start with like, what is digital humanities and try to define it. And that's really, um, I don't even, that used to be like the main question for, uh, uh, in the, in the DH literature and the DH conversations. I don't even hear that anymore. Um, because it never, it, it's, it's sort of a pointless conversation. There's never any agreement about it. It means different things to different people. And now uh, DH has been so, uh, uh, um, you know, grown so much and so widespread. There's just different strains of DH and different audiences for that. And attempting to define it doesn't really do anything. Um, and when I was, when we founded IDRH, I kind of, felt like I could represent digital humanities to some extent and had a, a little bit of a feel for what was going on in the field and the latest trends. Now it's just really so difficult to keep up. There's just so much happening at various levels. So, but what I wanted to uh, share here is just a few slides um, about how people have been thinking about DH and different sort of, I don't know, windows on it, uh, just to just show the variety and to, uh, provide some, some background and maybe get us thinking. Um, so one of them here is uh, that DH, uh, so this is an article by an, another librarian, uh, Stuart Barner, uh, and he was imagining, you know, different ways that people have looked at DH. So it could just be, uh, it's just the humanities, it's the same thing, that there's not really a distinction between digital humanities and humanities, or it will become less and less of a distinction. It's just what we do as humanities researchers. Uh, there's, there's always been, and there still is this uh, wing of scholars who see uh, DH as uh, an example of uh, the, in you know the uh, uh, invasion of neoliberalism into a academy, it's about uh, it's, they see it as just about the latest flashy tools and ways to get grants and bring in more money. Um, so that's been an ongo ongoing kind of argument over over the years. Uh, 
post-colonial critiques have have really grown. I think that's one of the areas where digital humanities has um, has grown kind of uh, 180 degrees from the view that it's a, a neoliberal kind of endeavor. Uh, so it offers up this uh, opportunity to look at how um, tech, access to technology is is distributed uh, around the world, um, opportunity to include new voices that have been erased from archives, uh, and opportunities perhaps to, um, since the tools of DH are becoming so ubiquitous and easy to use, to really put those tools into the hands of communities and have the opportunity to capture material that's not typically captured by uh, academic libraries and to allow those communities to have more of a say in what how they're represented and telling telling their own stories. Um, most of you know a lot of DH uh, is uh, published. Ryan, uh, excuse me. Yes. I was just about to ask the same thing. Um, are you looking at slides that you want us to see? Oh, right now? oh my gosh. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. Thank you for that. Uh, I've been on Zoom for like almost four hours today and about five hours yesterday. So <clears throat> I'm a little bit, you can hear it in my voice too. Uh, let me see. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so I, this is just the first slide. I'm just going going through this uh, with Stuart's uh, kind of uh, outline of different ways of looking at DH. So many DH pro pro uh, projects are, you know, result in public facing websites. Uh, so there's a big aspect uh, of public di digital humanities. It's very closely connected with public digital humanities. Um, a lot of uh, it, uh, other approaches to DH are that it's always at the cutting edge of technology and, uh, and humanities research. So it's a space to kind of play with that technology. I mean, most recently, I think there's a lot of work in augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and kind of text mining and uh, I'm not text mining, but data mining of uh, audio and visit audio and video files. Um, and then DH can be empowering like that is what I kind of just mentioned about um, giving communities the, the power to uh, create their own resources. Um, another way that uh, you can look at DH is that it's um, this comes from John uh, Unsworth, who, uh, who is actually uh, the person who coined the term digital humanities back in 2004. Uh, he was the, uh, I don't know where he's at now. He, he was the Dean of Libraries at uh, UVA, I, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. But he, he uh, I don't know if he invented this list, but he based his vision of DH on this list of scholarly primitives. So the seven, he had seven, kind of essential things that he says that humanities scholars do. Discovering, annotating, comparing, referring, sampling, illustrating, and representing. Um, and that, you know, in his view, that's a, a way to look at, in digital humanities, we're doing the same kinds of things, um, just maybe with a different method or different, different tools, uh, which offer different sort of uh, affordances or can make use of as well. Um, oh, let's see. Here's a couple of quotes that are kind of been foundational in the field, I suppose. Uh, so in this one, this is Julia Flanders. Uh, she says that the field of digital humanities is characterized at a deeper level by a critical engagement with technology. And this engagement she characterizes as having a kind of productive unease, she calls it. And that's uh, yeah, focused around issues of representation, medium, structures of scholarly communication. And the unease comes from um, not knowing like the, uh, how, how not, not using the tools in these, in these new mediums um, and not being familiar with them, for instance. There's always this sense of being an eternal beginner um, when it comes to DH and um, and so some of this, and things break and trying to, things are lost in the migration from 
uh, analog to, to digital. Um, so that all that and though you know all the concerns around that or the anxieties or the uncertainty around that is is the unease uh, but she feels that it ideally it's a productive unease which helps us answer some of these these questions I mentioned at the bottom um Dan Cohen, who founded the Digital Public Library of America, he has a pretty also sort of straightforward definition, uh, the creation of scholarly resources to research, uh, research on those resources and the communication of those results. Um, there's a kind of materialist approach to DH, uh, so a series of material interventions uh, that define themselves in relation to the affordances of other more familiar media. As uh, another similar approach, exploring the connection between different media forms. And I will send you these slides as well with all the links. Uh, there's the kind of library perspective, um, which uh, in some ways is more, um, I mean, there's theory behind it, but it's also more uh, uh, sort of based in, in, in action and, and laying the groundwork to get uh, to have the infrastructure to do digital humanities projects. So there's what libraries can do with our own collections. Um, there's the uh, pedagogical role that libraries can play. And then there's the infrastructure uh, the technical infrastructure and the collaborative infrastructure that libraries can play. And that's one thing that I like about uh, our institute here is that it is based in the libraries or it's a partnership that includes the libraries. Um, many places have a DH center that's based in a single department, for instance. And that's, uh, you know, there's maybe some advantages for that department, but um, it make it, it it lacks the kind of collaborate and collaboration and network uh, opportunities that um, having it based in the libraries can can offer. And then, so I, I so just the way I've been thinking about it though um, recently is uh, is is I tried to create this little uh, oops it's I even had a typo this little uh, uh, chart here. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we've seen a lot in the last couple of years, really three or four years, uh, is um, the community part of digital humanities. So this comes from uh, uh, Alex Hill. I don't know if some of you may know him. He was recent until recently, he was the DH librarian at Columbia University. And he tries to package all of what we just went through in one kind of simple scheme. Um, and so he sees digital humanities as first, uh, you know, the 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 uh, migration of our cultural and scholarly heritage into the digital realm. Uh, so digitization, essentially, but with attention to all of the uh, qualities that might be gained and might be lost in that um, in that transition. Um, but really. That is about access, uh, preservation, and, and getting those, um, having that culture and that scholarship live on. Uh, the, yeah, so that second one is supposed to be uh, analysis. Um, so what, what that end result is, is uh, huge, you know, collections of scholarship and cultural heritage on a massive, massive scale. Just looking at Google Books alone, uh, you know, as their goal is to digitize every book ever published ever in the history of the world. Um, and I mean, they probably won't get there, but they've got, I mean, I don't know, a couple of years ago, anyway, they had over 30 million books digitized. Um, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, the BBIP collection is already too big for one person to read, uh, in any reasonable time, but but 30 million books is just um, ridiculous. Or just think of all the uh, oral histories, all the types of content that's 
that's out there now, all the library collections. There's so much out there. Um, so how do we, what do we do with that? What opportunities does that provide uh, to work with these materials at scale? Um, what patterns can we find? Um, what are, what are, um, what kind of new kind of research does that enable? What kinds of things is that not that, that distant, uh, that, that large scale work not good for? Uh, what gets lost in working with things on that scale? So the, 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 in the Google corpus, you know, even though it has 30 million books, it's still a very uh, biased corpus. They're using, they're, they're largely built on research library collections uh, that were created in the 50s and 60s. So it represents um, an American and European, American and European collections uh, and the gaps that those libraries or the, the collecting interests of those libraries. So in this way, um, you know, these digital tools can offer uh, a lot of opportunities for some in incredible kind of data gathering and, 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 and research, but they also can um, uh, reinforce archival gaps and uh, current hierarchies. So there has to be a lot of attention paid to how that is uh, how that is done. And that's also one reason why digitization of a wider range of materials is, is really important. And then the third part of Alex's uh, sort of three pillars, and I, I'm just kind of paraphrasing from what I've heard him speak about. I don't know that he has this written out anywhere, but the third pillar is community. And I've alluded to this a couple of times already, like community voices uh, being able to create their own community archives um, to cap, to uh, put online the things that are important to them or to have a say in using these tools and how they partner with, with academic institutions. Um, and we'll see, I mean, in my, in my, I, my, you know, view is that uh, in the last, in, when I started with IDRH in 2010, like the first five years, there was some incredible research going on, but it was very much about the tools and the data. And um, we can see some examples later. There wasn't really much about the community and the empowering opportunities for, for digital humanities. Um, that's really started to change, uh, at least in the US uh, especially, um, which, is, which is good to see. Um, so, uh, well, why don't I just pause actually and if folks want to uh, ask questions or have, have thoughts about any of that, if that resonates. Yeah, Mary Emma. Uh, I, I found it curious that uh, the, the ambitiousness of DH, as you describe it, that Google expected to, you know, every book should be digitized. And I recall, since HBW is going to be turning 40 next year, that at the very beginning, which we were pre-digital, we also said we would like to have every Black book available. So it's interesting how that ambition continues to persists, that is, it is an ideal that it offers the possibility for having access to books that we haven't seen before, we didn't know exist. So for us, it was, the purpose was recovering the books, but then once you recover so that they don't get lost again, you have to digitize them. Mm -hmm. And we've been around long enough so that many of the places that we have got those early books from do no, lo no longer have those books. So had we not digitized and we, we first photocopied, then we digitized because digitization didn't have a, there was no term for that in the eighties that mm -hmm. we were aware of, but had we not done it, those books would not have survived at all. So our rough photocopy is probably the only copy for some things that no longer exist. So I do think there's this sense of the possibility that it allows you to do, particularly for, for understudied, underread, undersourced materials. Um, so and that's something that like Google couldn't do. I mean, right, only a project exactly. of, of your size could. I and mean, Google has other motives of besides course. preservation. 
uh, that they're doing. So that's also another factor in, in all of this. Um, and they're notoriously bad at metadata and all the other things that uh, go along with it. Yeah. Yeah, the archivists and libraries can can bring. Okay. Well, I will move on. Uh, and next on my slides is just a little bit, this will be fairly brief, about about IDRH. Uh, and so Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities, as I mentioned, we are uh, we are founded in 2010. Uh, we're a very small unit, really. It's just usually two part-time co-directors, um, and we bring in as many people, uh, collaborators, as we can. We ha do have finally this year, or last year, of one, our first ever full-time staff person. Um, but uh, we offer a number of, of programs. It's evolved a bit. Uh, as Mary Emma mentioned, we have an annual DH conference, or we did up until 2019. Uh, we currently have a fellows program, which I think operates maybe similar to, to the BBIP program. We select 10 faculty and students from around KU and we help mentor them, discuss their projects, offer workshops uh, for the year. Um, and that goes in conjunction with our digital storytelling colloquium where we invite a number of speakers. Um, and all of these uh, are on our website. Um, over here and on our YouTube channel, we have uh, something like, I, I don't know nowadays, but 240 videos, presentations of workshops and speakers going back to 2010. Um, so it's a really kind of interesting snapshot of how DH has evolved. And uh, we have an index that helps um, people to find, find some of those. Uh, we offer training workshops research consultations. Uh, sometimes we offer uh, digital humanities courses, or we don't offer them ourselves, but we help support them. Um, and as I mentioned, our YouTube channel. Uh, and so in general, it's, um, you know, this is how we think of our, our mission, I suppose. Uh, we lower barriers of entry to faculty, for faculty and students. Uh, we promote collaboration among research and teaching faculty, librarians, students, uh, other, other units on campus and beyond. We create a space for experimentation and we help uh, the KU community share scholarship and basically creating a, trying to create a, a culture or a community of digital humanities at KU. So we've had, when we are doing things in person, hopefully we'll bring this back soon, have research sharing sessions, which have always proved popular among uh, KU faculty. And most recently, we've been involved with uh, a couple of other initiatives. Um, one is uh, our colleague James Yeku's um, African Digital Humanities Initiative, initiative, which was, I think, when he founded it, the first of its kind in the U.S. Um, I, there may be an, a, 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 there may be some others now, um, but again, he we do an annual he does an annual symposium webinars. Uh, and supports digital digital projects um, that are about or from or related to Africa or the African diaspora. Um, so there's some great stuff online too with that. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm busy with right now. So the thing I'm working on now is um, we're hosting our own institute uh, in about a month here in Lawrence, uh, an NEH funded Institute called the Public Digital Humanities Institute, which is intended to support digital projects that are academic and community collaborations. And it's really an opportunity for community members to train side by side with their academic partners in issues that, and it will cover uh, issues, um, you know, workshops on platforms and things like that, but also bringing in uh, uh, case study projects and the directors of those projects and a lot of work on just community engagement, um, which has been a big part that's been missing from the digital humanities. So there's information on the website about that and we're hoping we're bringing about, we're bringing 12 projects from around the country here to KU, 24 participants. 
Uh, so re really looking forward to that. Um, so uh, well, next, I thought I would just go through a lot of different examples. And we can, if there's one that grabs your eye, we can stop and talk about that. I might skip some. Um, but there are so many different types of outputs or products of the digital humanities or methods that uh, it's, this is just a fraction, but these are kind of some of the things you might see. Uh, distant reading, which is um, kind of reading uh, a large collection of text at scale rather than kind of in opposition to, to close reading. Uh, there's digital scholarly editions. So I think somebody had mentioned um, the opportunity to work with with plays uh, or, or drama text, drama dramatic texts, and uh, so there's a professor here in in the English department who's done a lot of that work with 19th century uh, plays, doing uh, critical editions with annotations and commentary, um, and sometimes with different versions of of the of the text. Uh, mapping projects are super popular and can be very powerful. Um, oh, let's see, historical 3D models. So we again, we have someone at KU working on, uh, uh, who's in, in studies ancient or works, on, uh, oversees our classics museum and um, is creating a version of the Parthenon frieze uh, using 3D printing. Um, and video projection and uh, augmented reality uh, to recreate the, the freeze in um, its original colors or what is perhaps its original colors. Uh, and it's a student involved project and it's kind of going to tackle this issue of whiteness in the digital in in the field of classics. Uh, um, so uh, let's see, crowdsourcing as a, as a method, um, digitization, of course, uh, and so on. There's just a game, uh, you know, getting into gaming, game studies, text markup, uh, things like that. So I, let me see, so these are in no particular order, but I will just um, go through some examples, maybe. Um, uh, let's see. So this is a uh, yeah, and uh, so mapping um, and and some of the uh, uh, I think it's a it's getting more and more common to digital humanities can be a very powerful tool for activism uh, and resistance projects. So we see this uh, a lot in. Um, well, I'll just say, start with this example. This is a map. Um, Kind of layered on top of Google Maps uh, that shows with with all the current geopolitical boundaries removed and showing the uh, traditional native um, indigenous nations and their their geographies. And so you can type in an address, like your home address or whatever, and it'll zoom in on there, um, and you'll get to see, you know you'll see what nations uh, occupied that land, what treaties were available, uh, or were what treaties were uh, written and applied to that, that history. And uh, so it's, and yeah, so it's, um, it's a really uh, interesting resource. It only works in the US. I guess there's some here in, in Mexico. Uh, and it's not entirely accurate. It's just based on data that a certain scholar has uh, um, has collected. Mm, but, uh, you know, we've had people use this in the classroom as uh, an example of ways to really think about maps and different ways of experiencing uh, our, our, our surroundings and how maps can help with that. And I just remember one really interesting comment from a student uh, who had this emotional reaction to this and you know he said it was um it was like a brute the the colors the purple and uh orange and shades were like a bruised uh bruises on the land um so these this kind of brings this um 
I don't know, this uh, emotional uh, impact as, as well. Uh, but again, but all these are also based on just having data, uh, uh, formatting the data, cleaning it up, structuring it so that it can be uh, plugged into these, these visualization tools. Um, some, a lot of these are from KU. So uh, this is a project um, from the uh, in ling linguistic project. Uh, creating digital editions of early um, Central Asian texts in, uh, in Indo-European languages. Uh, and it, um, so it's really uh, kind of digitizing those texts, transcribing them, and then annotating li linguistic uh, aspects of those uh, using some text markup language called TEI, the Text Encoding Initiative. Uh, another project, um, and this is by Dave Tell. Some of you may be familiar with this one uh, because it's been getting a lot of attention uh, in the media. Um, Dave is my co-director of IDRH at the moment. This is the Emmett Till Memory Project, which is a website and a phone app that um, tells the story of uh, Emmett Till's murder, as well as the, um, the way he's been the, the way he's been remembered in various locations in the Mississippi Delta. So it works partly as a um, like a like a, an app that you it's geo referenced. So if you're driving through the area or just looking at it uh, online, um, it gives it tells you where the important sites in uh, that story um, occur. And, it's, and it also links to original documents as well as narrative about how different, um, uh, different memorials have been set up for Emmett Till or not. Uh, and um, it's also an attempt to uh, do a kind of digital uh, memorialization um, because some of the physical signs uh, have been repeatedly destroyed by, by bullet fire over the years. They go up and they're immediately destroyed. And so this is um, uh, partly a way to create um, a remembrance that is not uh, subject to that kind of vandalism. Um, so it's, um, it's based on maps and original collections of original documents. Uh, another KU project is more of um, another TEI literary project. It's, uh, and it, this one's interesting because it was done by students with a faculty overseeing it, collecting World War I poetry by American uh, by immigrants um, to the US. I think it's largely German immigrants here, but um, they went through, uh, it was started as a class project, I believe, and then it kind of grew from there, but uh, collecting, identifying, collecting examples of poems um, that met the criteria, uh, transcribing them, doing some markup so they can display online and uh, make a searchable collection of immigrant poetry. Uh, here is another uh, example of using maps and data for um, uh, more activist purposes or social, socially oriented purposes. This is uh, a project called Torn Apart. Uh, it was created, uh, it's kind of a grassroots um, project that was started by librarians and some other scholars uh, and built in the course of just a couple of weeks. It was started uh, in response to the, the family separation policy at the US-Mexico border. And it includes a lot of visualizations about, um, so this particular one, which is the home screen, when you pull it up, uh, shows different uh, detention centers um, across the country uh, and 
sort of as a way to demonstrate that this is not just uh, an issue at the border, but that there are people uh, being detained all over the country uh, being deported from these areas. And as you, you can zoom in and get different visualizations, including overlaying it on uh, Google Maps and able to see the, the, some, the locations of these, these centers. Um, also identifies private centers and then it includes, I don't know, maybe 10 or 12 visualizations, like all very interesting ones um, and reflections and links to uh, more resources. Um, it, this one is a bit dated because, you know, it hasn't been updated since it was originally created. Uh, so it was made for a certain time and place. It was kind of, they call it a rapid response DH project. <clears throat> and uh, um, it, it also involved a lot of kind of uh, what you might not think of as DH questions, but uh, re around privacy ethics, what they openly available, like this data was is openly available, but not in any one place. So the data around the locations of these, these centers had to be kind of gathered from around the web. And they made a decision not to publish the, um, the exact addresses of those, uh, of those centers because uh, they were worried about anti-immigration protesters showing up at those, at those locations. Um, so there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, kind of ethical and practical considerations that went into this project. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. I, I would highly recommend looking at it. Um, here's a more kind of, I guess, traditional DH project. Uh, this is one I worked on um, like 20 years ago at uh, the University of Michigan. This is just a digital edition of a, of a 16th century diary from London. It includes, it brings together all the previous editions, including uh, the images of the original manuscript pages, which had been damaged by fire, uh, transcriptions, um, reconstructed text that was that was that is missing in the in the in the burned pages, but has been um, there's different disagreements about what has been restored or not, as well as, you know, or which is the correct word there. Uh, so include citations to those and the different alternatives, as well as a modernization of the uh, spelling. And this is a diary of daily life in London. So people may just want to read, read, read it for the information, or they may want to use it to really do more scholarly study. Uh, Another mapping project, um, this is, was for a classroom project. So this is an example of using DH in the classroom to, um, as, a, as a teaching tool to maybe get a new perspective on, uh, on a traditionally taught book. So this is uh, called War and Peace Geographies uh, in which the professor here had uh, students map the, the geographical paths of the major characters in the novel as, as they proceeded through the novel. Um, and so you're able to get a snapshot of where the different characters and the ac action of the novel take, took place. And the professor was using that as a, um, as a mechanism to, to get people to think about the, uh, the, the space uh, in, in, in Russia and uh, kind of this idea of center versus periphery and what locations are important. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's used as a sort of teaching tool to create another, uh, introduce students in a, in a new way to some of the themes of the novel and also have them be a part of creating such a project, uh, which they really liked. Uh, this is an old one, but always a favorite one. This is an example of a crowdsourcing project uh, that the New York um, Public Library created. They have a collection of uh, hundreds of thousands of menus, restaurant menus from the, uh, I don't know, like the uh, yeah, eight, 1800s, late 1800s and the first half of the 1900s. 
and you know they can't be easily uh, the text can't be easily deciphered by OCR software. So they had created this uh, site where people could log in and just pick a menu, transcribe it. You know, orange juice, ten cents, or whatever, and um, it's kind of the perfect project for that kind of crowdsourcing uh, activity. There are so many, you know, there are so many uh, historians of food or foodies or just people interested in, for whatever reason, that they actually couldn't keep up for a while with digitizing the uh, images fast enough for the demand of people who just wanted to transcribe them. Um, so when you're doing a crowdsourcing project, uh, you know, not everything is, not every project is uh, suitable for that. Uh, the worst example that uh, comes to mind right now is somebody had a proposal that I read for, um, they wanted to study IRB, Institutional Review Board policies at different institutions. And they thought they could get volunteers to log in and transcribe IRB policies. Um, I don't know what they were really thinking. So, uh, <clears throat> so not every project can be a crowdsourcing project. You really have to have the, the community <laughs> community there. Uh, um, oh gosh, there's more examples I could show, but I, I probably left them in some other slides, uh, but we can uh, talk more about all of these at some point. Um, I just wanted to go through a couple of other issues and uh, not necessarily projects, but um, one is kind of thinking about global DH or, or DH on a global scale. So the top picture is a list, uh, is, a, is an image of kind of institutional digital humanities centers. Uh, and as you can see, they're all in um, uh, US and Canada and Europe by far for the, for the most part. Um, that's where also the funding is for DH projects. That's where the publications are or the, the scholarly journals. Um, so those are the areas where, which determine you know, what DH projects are uh, considered valuable and are funded and are visible. Um, but uh, in fact, there are a, a, a lot of digital humanities. There's a lot of digital humanities going on in those blank spaces on the map. And so one, one project that attempted to bring some visibility to that was called Around DH in 80 Days. And then it highlighted uh, a different digital humanities project from different regions of the world. So here you can see, you know, it already has, um, and this was about 10 years ago, I think this was made, but, um, you know, it highlights uh, 10 or 12 projects from the African continent uh, which are very invisible and on, on the global stage, or at least used to be. Um, so there's this uh, need to um, recognize uh, a more wider variety of DH that meets the needs of the local communities, the languages, uh, the, the, and also is aligned with what perhaps uh, you know, the infrastructure is in terms of technology and access to the internet and bandwidth and up-to-date machines. Um, a lot of that just gets ignored through the, uh, our, our kind of institutional DH approaches um, because simply, uh, you know, there are places in Africa that don't have reliable access to the internet or um, the tools are not developed in those languages. Uh, so this, um, I was a, a part of, I, I off and on served on the uh, advisory or executive board for this. There's an organization called GoDH, Global Outlook Digital Humanities, which attempts to break down these barriers across different sectors, low income countries and high income countries. And they do webinars and um, they have translation initiatives. Uh, and, and things like that. And they provide, um, try to provide stipends for, for uh, 
researchers in those countries to be able to travel to the main international DH conferences, which are, are all in Europe and the US. Uh, there's another group that, uh, you know, these are just ones that I'm particularly interested in and have worked with. Uh, so one called the Minimal Computing Working Group, which has a, a lot of the same, along the same lines as the GoDH uh, group. It's actually part of, uh, it's a GoDH initiative. And this is thinking about um, how to do digital humanities with minimal resources. Um, uh, you know, some kind of constraint on access to hardware or software or uh, digital literacy or electricity. Um, and uh, to recognize that, and also to recognize the innovation that's being done in places with those constraints to, um, to make their resources available. Those kind of projects, uh, I think more nowadays it's they're being recognized, but I, I think eight or 10 years ago, um, if that kind of work was submitted to a major DH conference in, in Europe or the US, it would, get, uh, it would get rejected as not being innovative or, uh, you know, because, oh, they're using a, they're using WordPress or something that's not like a true DH platform in some people's view. Uh, I think now there's a lot more recognition that these projects are of value and should have some more visibility within the institutional DH, DH world. Uh, so minimal computing working group is one group that is thinking about that and looking at just different definitions of minimal, what it means to be minimal, using minimal resources, uh, needing minimal uh, technical knowledge. Um, there's a lot of different ways to think about that and approach it. Um, so I, 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 I find that a really interesting group to work with. Um, oh, this one should have been in the examples, but this is a great, I, I love this project, uh, even though it's, it's, it's years old and it's still really effective. It's called um, Invisible Australians. And this is a uh, <clears throat> Um, it's done with, uh, you know, automated technology. Uh, it's an attempt to humanize um, the Asian population in Australia under their white Australia policy, uh, and also to rethink the way uh, a, a digital archival interface might work. So these are uh, images that were, you know, that were recognized by facial recognition technology um, from collections on the uh, site of the National um, National Library of Aus Australia or National Archives of Australia. These were documents, kind of giving uh, that were just either people of Asian descent had to register their location or had to get permissions to travel, and so. Uh, while they were made invisible in the nation's history and, and life at that time, they are paradoxically super well documented and made of it and found in, in the archives. And the uh, Australia has been very good about making, you know, making its entire its archival collections available online. But normally, uh, I don't know if I uh, normally uh, you would go to the archival website, search in by the, you know, this very bureaucratic process, search by uh, you know, collection number, box number, item number, ID number, and just this grid of, of bureaucratic organization. Finally find a link that will give you the page image of the entire document with a little photo of the person up in the right corner. This take just kind of reverses that, that uh, that process. So when you go to that web page, um, the the only thing you see is just these these close ups of these faces, and you scroll down uh, through them. There's no information about them, but you know it really br it, uh, it brings out you know the the really evocative. And then as you click the face, then you can get into then you see the original document that it was from, and then you can click in there and you can get to the 
the official, you know, numbered collections. Um, so it kind of re, re, reverses that process. It makes us think what it, what and how we discover things, what an interface can convey. Uh, and a follow-up project to this is um, attempting, because the address information is on those forms, so attempting to reunite digitally uh, families that were separated uh, you know, um, at the time or um, separated in the archives anyway, uh, that may exist in completely different collections, but they can bring them together, uh, the images together in a website and, and connect them that way. Um, so again, it's, a, it's a, an attempt at trying to humanize um, and maybe make a, a more of an emotional impact uh, on a way to tell a nation's history. Uh, finally, um, yeah, and then I, there's just some resources here about uh, thinking about humanities um, content as data uh, and learning how to think of it as data and organize it as data so that, you know, historical uh, information is not just a narrative, but might be data that you want to preserve and turn into visualizations. Um, and some other resources for the kind of large scale text analysis. Uh, so again, I got, I have a little bit more, but I wanted, um, I'll stop there and just maybe a good time for a pause and people can respond or say what you thought was interesting. Um, or if any of those projects kind of captured your attention you have questions about how to make one of those projects like that. Ryan, I thought the whole presentation was fantastic. And I'm really interested in the augmented reality. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be possible to have a conversation with you? At some yeah, point? Uh, oh, certainly. I, I'm happy to have a conversation with, with you and anyone else um, about their projects, your projects, their ideas. Uh, augmented reality, I'm not um, that knowledgeable about. Uh, uh, basically, um, so the, at least the way our professor here is using it is uh, creating, a, doing a, a virtual recreation of the Parthenon freeze on the phone. Um, and then you can hold up your phone to point at the, um, the freeze or any other location and then uh, an object will appear as if it's there, but only on your phone. Uh, it won't, wow. It's not there in real life, but you, so you're, uh, you're viewing what it might have looked like uh, through, your, through your phone. So he had some examples in, uh, those of you at KU know Wesco Hall, which is pretty, you know, um, bland to walk through and where he was putting up the Parthenon freeze in color along the walls of Wesco as you walk through it and it looked really wow. great. Uh, and that was just kind of the way he was testing it out. Um, but you, you know, it wasn't, they weren't really there. You wouldn't, and they had, he had a picture of someone looking at them. You wouldn't see them. There's nothing there. And you'd only see them if you have the app and are looking at it uh, on your phone. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. I have three questions actually. Sure. So the first one is about the map that you showed of the native land. Mm -hmm. I did not catch the website address for that one. I wanted oh, yeah. to write that down and I didn't see the website address being um, shown on the screen there. Yeah, and I'll also, put it, mm -hmm. I'll put it in the chat, but I'll also send out those slides. Um, oh, okay. And, yeah, and may, you said that, there, but... yeah, I didn't see it on there. You said that there was a professor in the Department of English at your university who does um, plays sort of in the 19th century. Could you give that name? Yes. Yeah, I had that note uh, next to your name, Robin, uh, about that. Uh, her name is Laura Milkey, uh, and she's published in, let me try to get another link, uh, a journal called Scholarly Editing, um, which publishes, uh, and which is uh, out of Nebraska, I believe, and it publishes um, 
kind of additions of text and using XML and the text encoding initiative. These are kind of markup languages for, for literary text and they really help you um, create that XML as well as the, the editors there. Yeah, so I really, really like the latter part with the many different examples of different mm -hmm. types of projects. That is something that's very helpful to me as a beginner. I guess this question is, is kind of for Mary Emma and her team as well. I was curious to know, is there um, a website or something that has um, a really, really expansive um, collection of the different types of DH projects that are ongoing concerning Black people? I think Brian's point is well taken here. There are so many projects out there, it's hard to keep up with them all. The second point is also the case. A lot of projects are invisible. There is a discrepancy between projects that are recognized and mainly funded and projects that are sort of self-starters still looking for funding and therefore don't have the visibility. We get as much, we pull together as much as we can, but there's no one place to go to find all this out there because there is so much. Okay, um, but what, what Brian just um, put in the chat is extremely helpful. <laughs> that's yeah, that's yeah. along the lines of something yeah. I was looking for, so that's a great starter. But yeah, point yeah. taken, Mary Emma. I, yeah. I, I, I understand that. So I'll always um, keep that in mind too. Yeah, and so, a, yeah, oh, go sorry. ahead. You know, I was just gonna say, this is a, a crowdsourced um, document uh, where mm -hmm. people were asked to put in projects <clears throat> that they know of. And uh, a lot of them, you know, some of them are really great projects. Some of them I think are just the start of a project or it was never mm -hmm. completed. and. So you have to poke around there, but you can see there's a, a lot to, to look at. So. Yeah. So I wanted to just zone, zone, uh, hone in on Brian's point about the conferences, the institutionalization of the field and how all those conferences up until very recently, virtually none of the DH projects that most of us might be doing were visible at those conferences or or, or it had opportunity to present at those conferences. So there really is a big divide between this institutionalization of DH and the world of GH as a whole. Uh, we try to have our foot in both sides, in the institutionalization side and in the world of DH in terms of a larger community. But there are those things. We're trying to cross that bridge as quickly as we can uh, and create more bridges but that is a reality. So you're right, unless you're talking about crowdsourced sites and they're changing all the times and people get money and they can advance, they don't get funding and they then slow down. By the time they get more money, the world has changed. The technology has changed. So the sustainability issue becomes a critical one. So that was the other point I wanted to make. Projects come and go. So somebody else had some questions I saw. I just, I was just wondering if the uh, Google Doc was regularly updated or if uh, it was just like <clears throat> a one thing. I mean, I think there's nothing to stop people from updating it, uh, but I don't know how much, um, how much active updating there actually is. And then I think uh, Dr. Jenkins is next. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, that was a great presentation with so much great information also. Um, I'm curious about the mapping feature. I know that there was a project on there. Um, I'm wondering about the limitations for uh, making the maps a global scale. And the reason why I'm asking is because I'm um, interested in the Crown Act and natural hair discrimination. And I'm currently doing research um, trying to collect narratives um, and experiences for Black folks around the world. So the Crown Act is based here in the US, but natural hair discrimination and anti-Blackness is a worldwide issue. And I would like to get that worldwide capture, but I'm wondering if there were limitations and that's why uh, that was only done in the US or um, 
I don't know if that's the best form of a question, but this is my inquiry. Unmute, unmute. Thank you, yes. Uh, there's a number of different uh, um, mapping tools that range from really sophisticated uh, to pretty simple and, um, and you know, it would, you'd have to figure out what's most appropriate for your project and what, what you want to do. So on the one hand, there's like ArcGIS, like full-scale GIS tools where you can do a lot of layers and <clears throat> geographical things. And a lot of people come to us and say they want to do a GIS project when they really don't, um, but they, they think of that as what they need for mapping. Um, there's, um, you know, there's always Google, uh, Google Maps and Google Earth. And so that, that gives you a global uh, thing, but I don't know, I don't know if you'd like want a snapshot where you can see the whole thing at once. If you wanted an interactive uh, kind of uh, website, um, you know, Google Maps or uh, if it's more historical, you, there's tools that you can do like timelines and look at maps and how data changes over over time. And then there's a very, like the one we used with um, the Tolstoy uh, project is just, uh, let me see, it's, um, it's called, here's one of the pieces of uh, confusion. There's, uh, so there's a, a very advanced GIS platform called Story Maps. Uh, but um, there's also very, the one we use for that uh, Tolstoy project is also called Story Maps, but it's very, it's very simple, uh, so it may not do enough for you, but it's, um, uh, you know, you just sign in and you can create it. You, you've seen it in like newspapers, I think, where you just click on something, you can put an image and some narrative next to it and move on to the next image. Um, so there's a lot of different tools. They are, anything that's based on maps can be global. Um, it just kind of depends how you want to present the information and uh, what you want people to be able to do with it, I guess. Thank I'm you happy so much. To, happy to share more details yeah. if you want. So. Pay attention to the chat too, because the people are putting things in the chat. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I just ended up putting what you just put. So oh, okay. <laughs> but I figured that's what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah so <clears throat> crafting these projects is an art. That's for sure. And uh, I, I didn't have time to go into this, but they're in the slides and I, I could come back another time and talk more about this. Um, uh, and that is uh, issue of sustainability. Uh, so there is a number of tools and um, that ask you whether it's um, a very small project, simple web page, or if it's a larger, big project like uh, the BBIP uh, corpus, um, to start thinking about sustainability from the very beginning of the project. What's what resources do you have? Uh, how how do you stru structure that so your project will be still alive and visible? three years or five years down the road, if, if that's what you want and um, uh, what you need to do to get there, like what stage your project will be at at that time, if it's, an, if it's a, still being actively created or if it's just online and you want it to be maintained but not much development on it, or um, you want it to be packed up and archived somewhere so, you don't, so it's available but you don't have to uh, pay for server space or things like that. So um, it just here is listed uh, some resources. Uh, the Endings Project asks you to think about how you want your project to end uh, before you begin it, and um, which is not usually the case. I mean, it can be used anytime that your, your project is, <clears throat> whatever stage your project's at. Um, the Socio-Technical Sustainability Roadmap, uh, which is a mouthful to say, but it's, um, 
is very in depth and it, it, it puts equal importance on sustaining the technology as well as the labor that's needed uh, to, to maintain a, a, a digital project. Um, and it walks you step by step through different um, issues and helps you create a, a sustainability plan. Um, and then the other thing I had here is, uh, oh, just a, a useful site um, that has some, you know, help, helpful information about what kind of platform to choose for your project and how to choose it uh, and what questions to ask. Um, so those I think are all, all very useful tools in, in planning uh, and managing a project. Um, but you shouldn't also be like totally strictly beholden to those tools. I mean, sometimes you just have to put something up and see, you know, learn by doing and uh, see, what's, see what's out there. And then the last slides uh, I he have here are just links to resources. So um, a list of publications, DH publications, peer reviewed and not, and open access and not. Um, reviews in DH, I recommend. It's uh, the first publication that really is specifically devoted to reviewing projects, DH projects, because people still don't really know how to evaluate a project like they do a journal article. Um, so this has short descriptions of projects. It comes out every month, I think, and uh, a short review of, of the project. Um, and it, it's great, uh, super useful. Uh, DH organizations, uh, well, these aren't really, oh yeah, actually I was gonna delete this slide. That was, um, I think I put the organizations here. Yeah, and then over here, uh, some great places to learn how to do work with some of these platforms. The Programming Historian has 100 lessons on uh, text mining, creating a digital exhibit, uh, creating some mapping projects, um, it, kind of really great step-by-step -step tutorials. Uh, the DH, this is just a great kind of starting point for finding out resources about DH. It's put together at the Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, yeah, and then I included that link, the Black Digital Humanities Projects link. Um, okay, thank you, Brian. Um, it looks like we have about two minutes left. Um, maybe time for one more question, if anyone has one more question. Okay, so um, Brian, yes, thank you, Brian. Round of applause. Yeah, thank um, you. And as I said, yes, <laughs> feel free to get in touch. Um, and either I can try to help you or put you in touch with somebody. Yes, I think I I will send a follow up email with uh, Brian's email. I'll connect everyone just to make sure everyone has everyone else's email. Brian, if you could send me the PowerPoint slide so mm -hmm. I could also uh, forward that. And I think I will be also forwarding the recording of this or we're putting it on the BBIP website, Sarah? Both. Oh, both. Okay, both. Um, okay, so I don't think I have anything else. Again, thank you so much, Brian. We really appreciate oh, thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Thank you.